Hello and welcome to this webinar on leading good autism practice from the Autism Education Trust. I'm Vicky Fitzackley and I'm Operational Manager for the Working Together team in Lincolnshire and Vice Principal for Gosberton House Academy, which is the strategic home of the Working Together team. Both are accredited by the NAS and hold advanced status and we are a licensed training hub for the early years schools and post 16 programmes. I am delighted to be able to share a little bit of what the leading good autism practice training involves. This webinar is very much a taster of the leading good autism practice module and is about developing practice at an organisational level. The Autism Education Trust is a partnership. The programme board are made up of partners of different organisations around the country that work with and for young people with autism. And the local training hubs feed into that partnership as well. So the national picture is very much about what's happening on a local level as well. The Autism Education Trust have a vision and that vision is for children and young people to receive an education that supports them fulfilling their potential as adults and makes them active participants in our society and that the adults around them are supported and empowered with the information they need in order to help those young people achieve those goals. There are three programmes within the AET and within each programme for early years schools and post 16, there are the training modules and then downloadable resources which link into those modules. The AET website also has information for parents, things like questions to ask when you're looking for a new setting. There's also some information on there for local authorities as well and a case study of how a local authority have employed the AET training and materials to support the development of autism provision within their authority. Within the schools programme, there is a training module on making sense of autism. This is a real basic level of awareness that you can share with all staff. So it might be your teaching staff and learning support assistants, but you could also involve your admin staff, uh, your site staff, your lunchtime staff as well. That training is 90 minutes, often delivered after school, but lots of the training hubs are flexible within how that can be presented so that it will cater for your needs. There's a full day on good autism practice, which is aimed at people working directly supporting young people with autism. And that's very much more strategy based, looking at how we can adapt things in real time within our classrooms to support our youngsters. There's then an extension of that module as well. The leading good autism practice we're talking about today and that the full module is a full day or six hours but can be delivered flexibly. So it might be delivered as four 90 minute sessions or two lots of three. There's a complex needs and participation module, which is for our more complex youngsters, perhaps looking at social, emotional, mental health or at participation within the learning environment. And there's a module on the progression framework as well. So if you have looked at the progression framework and you're really keen to get going with that and use it, but you're not quite sure how to do that, then the training will offer you the support with that and take you through it. This is an example of a slide from the autism standards. So these are on the Autism Education Trust website and are free to download. And these are looking at a setting and organisational level. The tool is designed as a self audit and a developmental tool. So you wouldn't expect to have enhanced in every single area. But the idea is that you use it to work out where your practice is as a setting at the moment and what your next steps would be. Within each standard, there are linked resources. So if you feel you want to develop that area further, you can have a look at those resources and see what can support you with that. They're also linked over to the competencies and the SEND code of practice as well. Within the Leading Good Autism Practice module, these are used and there is time allocated to review where you are as a setting so that you can develop an action plan to go away with. 
The competencies work in a similar way to the standards. So again, they're a free download from the website, but these are designed for individual professionals within settings. So this is looking at personal practice. Again, it's a self audit and a developmental tool. So you look at where you are now and where you're going next. There are lots of links to resources there to help you. It also links to teachers standards and across to the autism standards document. This might be really useful to feed into planning for continuous professional development or feeding into appraisal. And the resources there are really useful. So there are things like examples of social stories that might help if somebody is not yet confident with using that as a tool. The autism progression framework also sits on the website and there are a wealth of materials that you can download with that to support you in your setting. This has been designed as an assessment tool for individual children and young people. So this is picking up on the areas that we won't capture through national curriculum. So looking at the areas that are specific to their autism, or maybe they haven't got a diagnosis of autism, but they have a social communication need. And this is a way of looking at which skills they already have and what are their next steps. It downloads as an Excel spreadsheet so that you can use it as an assessment, but it also comes as a PDF, which you might just like to have as a reference tool for when you're setting outcomes and um, putting onto an individual plan or if you're writing um, towards a, an education healthcare plan. We find it really useful as a service to track back and backward chain skills. So when settings say to us, We've got huge issues with this young person's emotional management of it, their emotions and behaviour. We can then go back through this and say, OK, so which of these skills have they got in order to be able to do that? Because they're not going to be able to manage their own emotions and behaviour if they don't know how they are feeling or if they can't recognise those emotions. And that would be the starting point. Um, the same for things like being able to work in a group actually what skills have they got to be able to work in a group and what skills do they need first so they can be successful at that. This is a really useful tool. As leaders, you are the agents of change, so it falls to you and to us in educational settings to ensure that we are giving our youngsters the opportunity for fulfilling lives. And here are some of the reasons. So the SEND code of practice tells us settings need to employ their best endeavours to support young people with special educational needs. We had the green paper on support and aspiration, which then fed into the Children and Families Act 2014. The employment rates for learning disabilities are only 6.6% for paid employment and for young people with autism, are 15% in paid employment and that is not good enough. Lots of autistic people are really passionate about the areas they'd like to follow and would really love to be paid for the work that they're doing so that they can have the fulfilling lives that lots of us have the opportunity for. Exclusion rates are high for children and young people on the autism spectrum. Research shows that four in 10 children with autism have been excluded informally, which then means it's an illegal exclusion during their time at school. 20% of children with autism have been formally excluded in the past 12 months. And over half of parents of children with autism say they've had to keep their child out of school. Um, for fear that the school isn't able to provide appropriate support. Um, schools will often cite behaviour or lack of resources as a reason for exclusions and illegal exclusions involve parents being asked to collect their children or keep them at home because schools don't feel they've got the resources to do that. Are these really our best endeavours to support these young people? Our role is to give these children and young people the best opportunities for a fulfilling life. And to do that, we need to teach the skills that they need to achieve their potential. The case for change is clear. The social model of disability tells us that it's the environment that disables a person. 
your setting can make the difference between success and failed potential for a pupil on the autism spectrum. So how can you ensure that your setting enables a child or young person not just to cope with their time at school and to learn, but actually to thrive? Outstanding practice needs outstanding leadership. This is about raising the importance of our work at an operational and strategic level within a setting, raising the profile of autism within that strategic level, building it into the culture and the ethos of your school or academy. How do you create that vision for a better autistic environment? How do you get the buy-in from your staff? to align with that vision? Are there some quick wins that you can share through staff meetings that mean someone can go and apply that in their classroom and experience success really quickly? Or do some things need more time, more resources in order to be able to do that? How do you share the good practice that already exists within your setting? Because there will be some, if not lots, going on already. Do your policies allow for an individualised approach when flexibility is needed around difference? How do you ensure the perception of others is aligned with the buy-in for your vision? And how do we build capacity within your setting so that good autism practice isn't reliant on one or two people with lots of experience or lots of motivation and that if they're not in school that good practice carries on regardless? I really like this image in relation to inclusion. I think it makes it really clear that there is a difference between equality and equity. Inclusion is not about everybody being treated the same. It's about everybody having the same access. But how that, how that access happens may need to be different. We're thinking about access to academic learning. We're thinking about access to the environment. We're thinking about access to a social and hidden curriculum alongside an academic one. And we're thinking about our youngsters emotional learning and development as well. So how can we ensure that everybody in our setting has equal access to that learning? These are the principles that underpin the training. So we are focusing on difference, not deficit. We're not thinking about something being missing from our young people or something being added on. We are looking at difference, a difference in the way they process information, a difference in the way that they process and understand the world around them. We need to have high aspirations. We can't set a ceiling for these youngsters because of that difference. We want them to fulfil their potential. And we need to secure meaningful learning goals to the individual to build skills for life. And we need to focus on the goal and not the journey to get to that goal. So our youngsters will maybe on the same learning objective as everybody else in their classroom, but they may need to get there in a different way, in a way that is appropriate for them. Morewood says that to move a school towards being autism friendly, it needs to be saturated in autism understanding and awareness, that it needs to be a whole school rolling response and that developing the understanding of everyone involved is key. And that isn't easy. Everyone can have a positive impact, but the nature of their contribution will vary. We need to think about all the staff across our sites, our teaching and learning support assistants, but also our office staff, our lunchtime staff, our staff that are supporting the site, possibly pastoral leads and other mentors that you have within your setting. Everybody needs to have an understanding so that they can help adjust their interactions and adapt their practice for children and young people and families and it can't just be a one-off it can't be well we did some autism training two years ago and that was it it's got to be constantly under reflection and revisiting so that we can work out what went well and what do we still need to work on we don't always get it right those of us that have been working with autistic young people for years don't always get it right. It is about constantly reflecting back and working out for that individual, what could I have done differently? When we talk about autism, we talk about four key areas of difference. 
this is a really useful way to build an individual profile for a youngster in order to work out how we support them going forward. So we look at a difference in social understanding. It might be a difference in the way they understand social behaviour, how they understand the feelings of others and why people behave the way they do in friendships and relationships and knowing the difference between those types of relationships. Lots of social understanding is hidden curriculum, so we need to be prepared, be prepared to teach it. A difference in the way they process information and their interests. There are lots of different things within this section. It can be about generalising skills from one environment to another. So just because I've learnt to do the four times table in the corridor with my teaching assistant doesn't necessarily mean that I can apply those skills in the classroom with my class teacher. I may need to learn that skill in lots of different environments in order to be able to generalise it going forward. And the progression framework will help you with the levels that you need to achieve before you can generalise. Managing transitions, so not just the little things, but the big things as well. Lots of our young people have a passion for their interest and can have infinite attention for the things that are meaningful for them and then very fleeting attention for the things that maybe we're asking them to do. And that is part of their difference. It might be about their ability to absorb auditory or spoken information. Lots of our youngsters would struggle to look at you at the same time they are listening to you. And that's not them being rude, although it can sometimes be perceived that way. It is their way of managing the level of information that's coming in and making sure they can focus on what they need to do. Sensory processing is a huge area of difference for some of our youngsters. And we'll go into this a bit more detail on a, on a further slide. But it's really important to know what those differences are and how we can support those within our setting. And then a difference in the way that we communicate, and that is the difference between understanding and using language as well. A lot of our young people will have a difference in their receptive and expressive language. Now, we as neurotypicals automatically adapt our communication based on what's coming into us. And we do that very quickly, almost without thinking. But for some of our youngsters, the level of information they're using to talk to us is not the level they can process coming back into them. So we need to learn to adapt that. We might need to support that with some visuals. We might need to slow down. Um, lots of our youngsters won't tell us if they don't understand either, and they might mask those needs. So we need to be aware of that. Our youngsters are likely to have an uneven profile of ability or what we call a spiky profile. So it's really important that we observe how they use communication what they understand uh, and what information they might be missing. Is that the same in all areas within setting? Is it the same within academic learning as it is within social times with their peers? Where are their strengths and how can we utilise those for other areas of learning? What do we need in place, perhaps around their sensory differences or around their communication? And what are the next steps for that young person? The progression framework is a really useful tool here to track and identify what those steps need to be. So this is an example of individual profiles. So this is Connor and Connor is 10. Now, Connor is really into sea patrol, all about the Australian Navy. He really likes cars and car games. He's got some sensory needs around lights and around smell and clothing and some unpredictable sounds. He's got a strong sense of right and wrong. So how is that likely to appear in your setting? We're likely to see some things in the classroom around that strong sense of right and wrong, as well as at social times. We might see the sensory needs in the classroom. We may not. It may be that families see the impact of those sensory needs later when Connor gets home. What's really important for Connor? What's really important for Connor is that he has friends and actually he's got a real strength in cooking and loves baking. How can we use those things within our setting, those things that are really important to Connor, to ensure that we are enabling him for a fulfilling life? 
what reasonable adjustments can we make? What can we then address through a graduated approach? It's really important that we've got an awareness of the anxiety that our autistic youngsters face. And it's important that we recognise it may not be obvious to us either. Connor on the previous slide likes things to be where he's put them. And if someone moves his things, he finds that really difficult. That is something that will cause anxiety for him. And we might see that in a setting through some behaviour. We might see it through withdrawal or through a shutdown. But we might not see anything at all because Connor might be trying his best to hold all of that together. And actually, it's when he gets home to his family and he feels safe that he can let that go. So we they would see the impact of that later. It's really important for us all to work together to work out what those triggers are and see how we can reduce those in our settings and that we agree strategies as a team around that young person to reduce the anxiety that they're facing on a day to day basis. Developing trust builds an effective partnership, not only with the young person, but also with those around them and with families. Trust reduces anxiety for our young people. It builds their capacity to be able to share their feelings within the setting, to be able to work through any issues that are concerning them, to be able to begin to problem solve those issues. A lack of trust or broken trust can have a huge impact and for some of our youngsters can result in school refusal. So it just goes to show how important that trust is. And it's imperative for us that if we've said something is going to happen, that we honour that. And if we're unable to honour that, that we're that we apologise for that and we're really clear about why that couldn't happen and what we're going to try to do about that. So what are the key areas of good autism practice? We said it's really important to have high ambitions and high aspirations. Most of our families will tell us what they want for their young people is that they're happy and happiness might look different for each of our youngsters. But it's really important that we take into account what that happiness is for them. It's important to listen to their voice. What is their perception? of things? What is their perception of a situation that's maybe gone wrong? It will always be valid, though it may be very different from ours. So we need to work out how we can work through that perception to find a way forward. It's important to build positive relationships. So between pupils and staff, but also between pupils and their peers, having peer awareness of autism within their social circle can help develop an understanding of why certain things are different for those young people, why they perceive things in a different way. Perhaps you can have a buddy system or a social group around those differences. And maybe they need something different at unstructured times that caters for what they want to do socially at break time and lunchtime, remembering that that is downtime for our young people. So how can they use that in a way that is positive for them? It's important that we have trained and motivated practitioners, people who want to do the job, people who are always looking to understand more and to do better. Um, they've got a really important role as a cultural and social interpreter for our young people. So we want them to be passionate about what they're doing. If they're passionate about what they're doing and if they have a really good understanding, it means they can make those adaptations, those adjustments in real time for our youngsters as well when they can spot something isn't working. Having good communication between everybody is imperative. It might be that the young person needs some additional support in order for their communication. Maybe they need some visuals. Maybe they need additional processing time. But we need to be communicating well with the people that are around them as well and sharing information. What's working well as well as the things that we're trying to develop. Transitions can be tricky for lots of our youngsters at all levels. So at the micro transition level and the macro level just moving from one activity to another for some of our young people. But then the big things like changing setting, moving from primary to secondary, maybe moving house, new members of the family, all of those sorts of things. And our young people need to know 
as do lots of us, what am I doing? How long am I doing it for? What am I doing next? And when will I get to do the thing that I really want to do? And when you think about it, is that really far removed from the way lots of us work our day? We need to consider our young people's sensory differences. We have eight sensory systems and within each of those systems, our young people can have a hyper response or a hypo response. A hyper response means a little information feels like a lot and a hypo response means that they need lots and lots of that information for their system to recognise that that sensation is coming in. So we need to look at all of those systems, the sight, taste, touch, smell and hearing alongside vestibular proprioception and interoception. So vestibular is all to do with balance and orientation. Proprioception is all to do with our body awareness, our awareness of our muscles and our joints and the awareness of the space around us. And then our interoception is all to do with what's happening inside our bodies and the messages that those send to our brain. So knowing when we are hungry or when we are thirsty or when we need the toilet or when we're too hot or too cold or when we're in pain, those are our interoceptive senses. So it's really important that we build up a picture of what these differences are like for our young people. Some will be affected in all of those areas and some might just have more concentrated differences within some of those. We need to look at their individual profile, but then we also need to look at the environment. So it's worth profiling both. It's worth doing a profile of the individual and then doing a sensory audit of your setting as well and think about are there areas that we can adjust or adapt? Can we think about the lighting? Is there sunlight coming through that window, which if that young person sits there is really distracting from their learning? Is there a smell coming from the lunch hall that may be interrupts the learning for that young person is the fire alarm going off unpredictably an issue for that young person and if so how can we support them with that you can also get the young people to plan a journey through school and look at where are the hot spots so when they're coming into school in the morning and they're walking through the corridors on the way to their classroom and then as they move around throughout the day plotting that journey and where the bits are that are more difficult in that day and that helps us look at where the adjustments need to be made. Our best endeavours for inclusion are about shaping the provision around the pupil, not making them fit what we have in place for everybody else. Good practice for autism is good practice for all young people. So if we need to make a change to what we're doing, it's likely to benefit everybody. In the full Leading Good Autism practice training, you would spend a period of time at the end of each section looking at the autism standards and reflecting on your setting. So the opportunity to think about what strengths do you already have? Thinking about those four key areas of difference, thinking about the level of anxiety that some of our young people experience. What strengths have you got within your setting already? Where is their good autism practice already happening and how can you share that? And what areas do you feel need developing? Maybe you feel you need to do a sensory audit of the environment or maybe actually it's about spreading awareness through the setting and sharing the good practice that's happening first. Leaders who have completed the Leading Good Autism Practice training with us tell us that these are the things that they got from it. So being able to discuss the needs with the other professionals in the training and the outreach team there meant they felt empowered to go back and confidently explain how changes could be simple but make a huge impact within their setting. Another colleague explained that it gave them a structure and a framework to help them assist other colleagues within the setting, perhaps looking at how they induct new members of staff or how they introduce other people to working with a young person in the future. One of our leaders also told us this, 
that the discussion was particularly supportive as part of the training as lots of the things you're facing you feel you're dealing with alone and actually sitting down with other colleagues and talking about what you're trying to do makes you realize that you're not so what can you do next the full leading good autism practice module is six hours of training or can be four lots of 90 minutes in your area it may be two lots of three hours if you're keen to make the change for your setting to develop the practice that you have then visit the autism education trust website look at the schools program and the module to see where there is training near you or contact your local training hub if you're not sure who your local training hub is you can put in a request through the website and one of the team will get in touch with you to let you know where you can access your training from